Hey, it's Kay, and this is Skittles. Just a little treat for you before we get into this, because we're going to be looking at some really whack Nazi shit today. We're going to be looking at a video by British neo-Nazi Mark Collett, former head of publicity for the BMP, a far-right white supremacist group from the UK, for those lucky enough not to have heard of them. He also dates this charming woman here, and puts out videos such as The Jewish Question Explained, which, sadly, is exactly what it sounds like. We're not going to talk about that video, though, because the decades-old Nazi conspiracies he regurgitates in it have been long debunked, and I want to have a look at a more modern example of the way the far-right make their arguments. A few months ago, Mark uploaded a video titled Sadiq Khan, London's Muslim Mayor Exposed. But only about half the video is really anything to do with Sadiq Khan. I was planning to break this video up into clearly defined segments, but to be honest, it's kind of a rapid-fire series of claims and statistics, all in service of the idea that London is in ruins. Like it's fucking gone. Listen. London's demise. London was set on a path of destruction. London wasn't destroyed overnight or in a couple of years. London was destroyed by successive governments. London is an unmitigated disaster. This probably comes as quite a shock to all the people currently living in London who weren't aware that they were now on the set of a Mad Max film. Throughout this video, there's a phrase I want you to keep in mind. Using a truth to tell a lie. This tactic is not unique to the far right by any means, but it is a favorite of theirs. I first discovered this idea in the first chapter of Edward Said's Orientalism, in which British statesman Arthur James Balfour justifies British occupation of Egypt. He claims that because Egypt has a history of being governed by pharaohs in an oppressive monarchy-like governing style, a truth, that Egyptians simply prefer to be ruled in that fashion, or indeed naturally require it. A lie. He uses something that is understood to be true to justify a dishonest conclusion, and we're gonna see some of that throughout Mark's video today. So the first two main points Mark makes are that crime is tearing London apart, and that there's less white people than there used to be, and more Muslims. He does something very sneaky here. He sandwiches crime stats between stats about demographic changes in the city, so as to imply that these two things are connected. So we're gonna take a look at his first demography stat, then the crime stats, then his return to demography so as to respect the chronology, and also to demonstrate the tactics Mark uses to convey his real point. I warned voters that white British people would be a minority in London by 2012. And actually, those leaflets were incorrect. The BBC revealed that white British people made up just 45% of the population in London by 2011. Now, that's not what a minority is. If the other 55% were one group, then that would be the case, but taking a look at the 2011 census data that the article references, the next largest group would be people from all Asian backgrounds, including British-born. Even if we pretended that the Chinese, Indian, and every other Asian population of London were similar enough to group under one banner, which is ridiculous, that still wouldn't even come close to the white British population. White Brits in London still hold an enormous majority. It's very telling of the way people like Mark view the world, that they see 55%, which includes all other ethnicities, including other white people, as a monolithic other that could somehow constitute a majority over, again, the largest ethnic group in the city by far. London is a city where knife crime is at an all-time high. A city which this year saw its murder rate surpass that of New York cities, where acid attacks are on the rise, where moped gangs prey on passers-by. Next, Mark comes to the section about crime, a topic that he's very concerned about. Mark provides us with the headline of an independent article saying London's murder rate has surpassed New York's for the first time ever. Mark didn't bother to provide a link to this article, so after a quick Google search, I found it. And... While London remains substantially the safer city overall, with less than half the homicides of New York last year, a recent spike in knife crime meant February was the first month the UK capital was home to more murders than the US city. Substantially the safer city overall, huh? Not quite destroyed, is it? The news outlets are also to blame here, as they were all running with this story back in April when these stats were released. It makes for a scary headline, especially if you don't know that New York is the second safest city in the US with a population over 500,000. And even then, London remains substantially the safer city. 
Now, a few months down the line, we're able to highlight the reason that we look at annual trends in crime and not month by month. From January to June of this year, New York has seen nearly double the homicides that London has. And again, that's the second safest big city in America. I think London's gonna be okay. As you can see here, New York has absolutely dwarfed London in homicides in every other month so far. This is why we don't cherry pick. It can very easily make you look silly when someone else simply provides more information. I think it would be more appropriate yet to use entire years, like you're supposed to, Mark. Looking at 2017, the homicide rate per 100,000 population stood at 1.2 in London and 3.4 in New York. London has seen an uptick in homicides the past couple years but it remains much, much lower than it was in the 90s and early 2000s. And remember, in the 2001 census, London had about 7 million people, compared to 8 million in the 2011 census. We can expect some reasonable growth between 2011 and 2018 as well. And yet, despite over a million additional people, some of whom will be Muslims, oh no, there are still less homicides in 2018. And recently, Met Police Chief Cressida Dick has reported that in fact violent crime is decreasing as of September this year. And I'm sure Mark will be happy to hear that moped-enabled crime has also fallen by almost half, since that was such a big concern for him. Falling by half is pretty substantial, especially considering there's still so many Muslims. In stark contrast with the fear-mongering imagery of a city in flames that Mark tries to sell you, things are improving, and at their worst this year they were still far better than they were 10 years ago, long before Sadiq Khan was mayor and when there were fewer Muslims. The correlation Mark tries to draw between ethnic diversity and crime doesn't hold water. I couldn't find accurate data showing the Muslim population in 2016 when Sadiq Khan was elected. But it's fair to estimate that as the Islamic population has been growing rapidly across the UK, in fact, it is set to triple in size by 2050. So the Muslim population in London could have realistically been anywhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million when Sadiq Khan was elected. Mark shows us the headline of an article by the definitely trustworthy Russia Today, stating that Britain's Muslim population will triple by 2050. Again, this is implicitly understood by Mark to be a bad thing, but hang on, is it even true? Well, the RT article does name a study by the Pew Research Center, but they don't bother to link it. Fortunately, I understand basic citation, so I went ahead and found it, and it will be linked with every other article and study that I use, as well as Mark's, since he couldn't be bothered to link most of them. The Pew study posits three hypothetical scenarios. A zero migration scenario, a medium migration scenario, and a high migration scenario. Guess which one RT and Mark decided to go with? Yeah, it's, it's the high migration scenario. A high migration scenario projects the record flow of refugees into Europe between 2014 and 2016 to continue indefinitely into the future with the same religious composition, i.e. mostly made up of Muslims, in addition to the typical annual flow of regular migrants. In this scenario, Muslims could make up 14% of Europe's population by 2050, nearly triple the current share. Which means this projection assumes the refugee crisis is going to go on at its peak rate for the next 30 plus years. And even in that incredibly unlikely scenario, the study itself clarified they would still be a much smaller group than Christians and non-religious people. So this number is almost certainly not accurate. And the study also does not account for Muslims leaving. You know, a lot of people forced to flee their homes, should their homes become livable again, will want to return. The study uses a particular period of immigration from Turkey and North Africa due to labor shortages as justification for this but I find it hard to compare that situation to fleeing war. Overall, I'd say this report is incomplete, which is fine because the study also says this. The projections in this report are not meant to forecast the future, but instead present estimates for the religious composition of Europe under three migration scenarios to convey a range of what-if outcomes. Only somebody trying very hard to push a dishonest narrative would be using something like this as evidence of anything. This is typical great replacement myth nonsense. If you want to learn more about that, Sean has a very good video on the topic, but I am going to move on to Mark's next point.
As before the mayoral election, it was widely reported by both the mainstream media and alternative news sites that both Sadiq Khan and his family had shared platforms with those who have praised terrorists and openly supported Islamic extremism. The largest collection of information on these reported links can be found in an article by Zero Hedge. It's linked in the description below and it's well worth checking out. Mark spends the largest portion of the video doing something really weird. While he stresses that Sadiq Khan is not the reason London has been destroyed, he does spend a lot of time implying Sadiq Khan is sympathetic to Islamic terrorism. In fact, a list on alt-right conspiracy site Zero Hedge is the only one of his sources that he bothers providing a link to beneath his video. According to Media Bias Fact Check, Zero Hedge rates strong for conspiracy theories, but only mild for pseudoscience. So they'll likely try to convince you that globalists are secretly manipulating world events, but they hopefully won't try to sell you brain force about it. He links to a lengthy list of instances in which Khan has either defended or shared a platform with people connected to or said to be supportive of Islamic terrorism. These range from complete fabrications to things that are technically true, but don't really mean what Mark thinks they do. See, before Khan entered politics, he was a lawyer. Guess what lawyers and politicians have in common? Their work will have them associating with many, many people who they do not agree with. Serial killers still get defended in court. Mass murdering dictators still participate in diplomacy with other nations. Recently, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un have shared a platform. They've met, been friendly with each other. Something tells me they aren't suddenly best buds who agree with each other's politics. An example of something that is technically true but is being used to spin a false narrative is the case of Khan opposing the extradition of Babar Ahmed to the US. Babar is a London-born British citizen who was arrested in Britain for posting two articles that were supportive of the Taliban. Khan's desire to keep him in Britain and try him in Britain are extremely reasonable. And although he did eventually lose his case against extradition, the US judge found that his actions did not constitute a terrorist act and with time served, he was out in a matter of months. Even Boris Johnson, the missing link in human evolution, has stated that Babar should have faced trial in the UK. This was hardly a spooky Muslim conspiracy. Unless Boris knows something we don't. I'm not going to go through every individual claim on this list, but seeing as this is the one thing Mark actually provides a link for, feel free to have a look for yourself. It's a great case study in how information is selectively used to imply an association that can't really be proven. In fact, I'd like to juxtaposition this with what I did at the beginning of the video. See, while Mark tries to establish that Khan is sympathetic to some radical trend of Islamic extremism with vague, incidental connections like having shared a platform with someone or trying to have a British citizen tried in the UK, which very much echoes the right's attacks on Jeremy Corbyn for sharing a platform with people connected to Hamas to discuss the peace process between Israel and Palestine. What the fuck do you people think politicians do? One thing is clear from the information presented, that Sadiq Khan has, on numerous occasions, been reported to have shared platforms and attended meetings with those who have either been linked with or endorsed acts of terrorism. Here's a bit of free advice. The phrase shared a platform doesn't really mean much. And if that's all someone has when trying to prove that two people agree with each other ideologically, they probably don't. So contrast that with how I established at the beginning of this video that Mark is sympathetic to fascist politics. I don't tell you about how he once met with a fascist, or how he shared a platform with a fascist. No, I establish that he's worked with the BMP for many years, who openly engage in white supremacist politics. I show he's in a romantic relationship with a woman with a swastika tattoo, and I use his own words in his own video full of absolutely wild Nazi conspiracy theories to connect him to those sorts of politics. Do you see the difference? But we must never forget that Sadiq Khan has openly stated that terrorism is just part and parcel of life in a big city. I mean, it's not part and parcel of life in Tokyo or Beijing. Those cities are huge and are free of terrorism. Terrorism just seems to be part and parcel of life in multicultural cities with large Islamic populations. Mark closes his uh, video 
with a pretty unsupported claim that diversity in cities is what causes terrorism, and less diverse cities do not have terrorism. He cites Beijing, which is funny since Beijing is not free of terror attacks. This is another good example of using a truth to tell a lie. Terror attacks often happen in diverse cities, so diverse cities must cause terrorism. That's what we call correlation without causation, and it's generally considered poor form. My home city of Manchester is much more homogenous than London at about 80% white British population, and yet we were still hit by a terror attack last year. Moscow is about as homogenous as Tokyo and Beijing at over 90% of the population being Russian in the last survey, and they've had terror attacks. Meanwhile, Amsterdam, which is demographically similar to London, like many major cities are, has not had the same problems London has. There was a stabbing last month that certain people are trying very hard to establish was an act of terrorism. But even if that does turn out to be the case, that would put Amsterdam up there with uh, Beijing for terror attacks in the past few years. It doesn't seem that diversity is the deciding factor here. Most big cities are not racially homogenous, but there are many cities that have never had terror attacks. There simply isn't any correlation between racial diversity in cities and terrorism. And even if there was, that wouldn't establish causation. Mark achieves neither, and that's why Mark doesn't try to provide evidence to back up that claim. There isn't any. One last thing before we get to the conclusion, little nitpick here. Mark references a quote by Sadiq Khan multiple times in this video about terrorism being part and parcel of living in a big city. This is actually a misquote. What Sadiq Khan actually said was being prepared for terrorism is part and parcel of living in a big city. Which, yeah it is. I promise you, Tokyo and Beijing and every other big city are prepared for terrorism. They all have measures in place. By the way, as far as I could tell, that misquote originated in a tweet from Donald Trump's weird kid, so... The reason I've picked this particular video when Mark has said so much incredibly terrible bullshit is because this style of argument is extremely common on the far right. I mentioned using a truth to tell a lie a few times throughout this video, and you can really see it at every stage of Mark's argument. Truth. Knife crime is up. Lie. There is an unprecedented crime wave threatening our city. Truth. The Muslim population in the city is growing. Lie. They will replace us as part of some orchestrated conspiracy. Mark seems to either think you're gullible enough to believe him without checking his sources, or he genuinely doesn't bother to fact check his own arguments. It's almost like fascists don't care about what is true, and have come to their conclusions before searching for evidence. Funny that. And the sad thing is, there are real problems threatening the city of London. Skyrocketing property prices, stagnating wages, people being pushed out of their own neighborhoods. The number of rented homes in London is now greater than the number of owner-occupied homes, which means the fact that the average rent in London sits at around £2,000 a month is going to be relevant to more than half of London's households. And forget about buying your house in London, pal. And that's if you're lucky enough to even have a roof over your head. According to government data, the number of people in England sleeping rough has increased 73% in the past three years. And a lot of them are in London, where St. Mungo's found that a homeless person dies every two weeks. London is not in ruins, but it's facing serious economic issues that are hitting its most vulnerable citizens the hardest. But those problems aren't caused by poor refugees with very little political power. Those problems are caused by the wealthy class of landlords, property developers, and business owners with a fuck ton of political power. I wonder what it says about a person's goals when they ignore the damage the wealthy and politically powerful are doing to fabricate a threat from the poor and politically vulnerable. 